today. Uh, it's my joy to uh, be able to tell you how excited we are that David Barton is here, and you're about to hear him in just a minute. And, uh, I don't understand why I can't get this kind of a crowd to come early. I don't understand that. And so, uh, but uh, <clears throat> I want to bring you an update video on a pastor in California that we've been following, John MacArthur, who's taken a very courageous stand in an enemy state to the gospel and a state that has shut churches down. And he um, has just decided over the last several months to stay open and has come under tremendous uh, pressure. So I want to show you this video. I think it's very, very good. The church is essential. Hi, I'm John MacArthur, and I am pastor of Grace Community Church right here in Los Angeles, and I have been for over half a century. This is a church committed to the bedrock conviction that the Bible is the word of God, and we, in obedience to that word, have met together every Sunday for all these years. We have been protected by our government. We've been given freedom to do that. Today's current crop of politicians are trampling on the Constitution and on the resolve of citizens to demand their rights under the pressure of a manufactured fear. The reality is that the COVID data just doesn't match the government's COVID narrative. Here in the state of California, we have 40 million people. The people that have COVID now are one one hundredth of one percent, point zero zero one. You have a 99.999 chance to survive COVID. It's just not what they're saying it is. That absolutely does not warrant shutting down anything, but especially absurdly and arbitrarily, churches that have a special protection from the Constitution. Oh, and at the same time, leaving open abortion clinics, strip clubs, and marijuana dispensaries. And by the way, the health department is on record as saying they are going to allow riots and protests without regard for the mandated health and safety ordinances. This is obviously targeted discrimination. The leftists and secular government officials have no tolerance for biblical Christianity, so they're using COVID as an excuse to shut us down. We have to stand firm on the reality that the church is essential most meaningful, transformative, exemplary lives in a community all come together in the church. And that's been our impact on the city of Los Angeles. For 20 weeks, we had no ministry to children, young people, college students, young adults, families, no weddings, no funerals, no ministry to our precious disabled people, and no opportunity to make calls in the hospital to those who were sick. I started preaching to an empty auditorium, and uh, after a few weeks, our people started coming back because they didn't believe the narrative the local government and media were giving them. Week by week, more people came until finally we had about 7,000 people gathering for worship. The church is the original protester. We go back to the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago when the government was trying to dictate to the church how it should worship. This is a watershed moment in America. We have been granted by God the freedom to meet as a church, and that is protected by the Constitution. We need to be the church, not only because we're free to be the church, but because we're commanded to be the church by the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. This is a time of all times to meet as the church. Open your church. The church is essential. This has been used uh, by the government to try to shut the one institution that they fear the most down. That's the church. And so I hope that you will continue to pray. I don't know that uh, this uh, we're out of this, and especially with the election uh, just around the corner. So um, let me ask our ushers to come. We're going to receive our regular Sunday morning offering for you that are part of the Cross Point family. And then I'll uh, share some announcements with you during this time. So 
Let me pray for the offering. Father, we love you. We thank you that we have freedom to worship you, and we have freedom to give. And we're thankful that we can support uh, a church that preaches the gospel, that stands on the word of God without uh, any reservations, and that, uh, Lord, our commitment is to reach those in this city that are lost and need Jesus. So we just pray that you bless this time of giving. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As they're uh, receiving the offer, let me uh, do a couple things. One, um, I just received my voter's uh, packet in the mail, and uh, I'm, most of you probably did yesterday, received your voter information. And um, I've already had people call about uh, what to do on various uh, um, uh, questions or uh, amendments, I guess, maybe uh, ballots that are, are unclear. And uh, so if you uh, will pick up a voter information guide that I have put together, this is my suggestion. You don't have to follow it, but it uh, will give you at least um, an idea of which direction to go. And so you can pick one of these up at the information counter if you want to do that. Also, we have here uh, several people that are running for the state legislation. Le le <laughs> legislation, yeah. So would you all stand for just a moment? <clears throat> no, no, just those running, just those running. I'm sorry. Yeah. All right, very good. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> one of our dear friends, Brad Cheat, is here and longtime uh, representative for our state in this area and district. I just pray that uh, you will, uh, it's a shame to me that the church does not support uh, good people. Many, most are Christians that love the Lord uh, when they go into one of the darkest places to serve. And so um, when the church fails to do that, we are responsible for the, uh, for the failure of putting good people in places of leadership. So I hope that you will get to know them, and uh, I know that they would be glad to talk with you. Some announcements that are um, important for the body here. This Wednesday, uh, the, our ladies' meeting, and so ladies don't meet that, miss that at uh, 6 o'clock. They meet, right, 6 o'clock. And there'll be some food here and some great fellowship. If you're new to Crosspoint, this is a great event to come and meet some of the ladies. Also, uh, this Saturday, our men's breakfast. And so, yeah, and a great time to uh, uh, have uh, biscuits and gravy and just have a great time. We have almost 70 guys. We're going to, by faith, come into the auditorium because we believe we're going to have 80, and that'll be too much for that room. And so I hope that uh, you guys will plan to come bring somebody with you. We have two men giving testimonies that I know will be a tremendous help to you. Um, Tuesday night, if you like what you're going to hear from uh, David Barton on Tuesday night, we are showing his series. Uh, Mike is, where's Mike at? Uh, there he is. Yeah. Uh, don't say anything. I just recognize him. <laughs> And, uh, no, no, no. And uh, so Tuesday night, uh, he's uh, going through that video series, and nobody is more excited about that material than Mike is. And so uh, I hope that you'll show up at uh, Tuesday at 6.30. Is that right? 6.30 Tuesday night. Well, you know, uh, the Bible says, when the foundations are destroyed, what will the righteous do? There's nothing more important when building something and to think about the foundation upon which you're building. We never walk up to a building or a new house and go, wow, what a great foundation. <laughs> but we know that apart from a great foundation, the house won't stand. Nor will any nation. This nation has become a, uh, uh, a lighthouse to the world. And uh, our foundation <coughs> that created that was instrumental in all that we have become as a nation. And so we have forgotten that. And our, uh, our foundations are being destroyed on purpose, uh, with plan. And so I hope that you understand why we're doing this is because God gave us something 
that we are to be a steward of. And uh, you are held responsible for the time that God gives you and the gifts that God gives you and the calling that God has called you to do. You're responsible. You're, you're a steward. One day you'll give an account for that. And as a nation, we're responsible to protect what he has given us. And so this morning and tonight, uh, we're going to hear some great truths about uh, how our country came about. So let's uh, give uh, a man that I've come to know and love. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> You know, um, <clears throat> I've had a chance to uh, uh, talk to David a little bit about things that are happening and things that are taking place. And for you that have young people that you know are in your life that are uh, seniors or in the college years, 18 to 25, um, David Barton has an institute during the summer, week long, there's several of them, that he and his son does to really help young people get a foundation in life. And I hope that you will go on his website, look at that information if you're interested. It's a great place to send young people uh, to really build a filter in their life before they go off to school. Now, let's give him a hand. Now. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I, will, I wanted you to be able to see the pictures, so that's what we got on real quick. Uh, I want to talk to you about history. We're going to cover some things on history this morning. Famous historian and literary writer George or Orwell made this comment. He said, who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. Now, this thing, who controls the present right now, the way we teach history, the way we write history, the way we control the past. We choose from the past what we're going to present. And choosing from the past what we present, that's what controls the future. The way we see ourselves in the past is going to be the way we behave in the future. I'll give you examples of that throughout this morning. So essentially what this boils down to is how we present history determines what the future will be for us. The way we presented history for the last 20 or so years is largely on the basis of what we call deconstruction. Deconstruction is we're tearing things down. History is made of the good, the bad, the ugly. What we emphasize now more than anything else is the bad and the ugly, not the good. I don't say that lightly. I'm appointed in a number of states by state boards of education to write the history and social studies standards in those states. Working right now with North Carolina, New Hampshire, other states as well. So I see what's in the textbooks. I see what's in the, going on. And it's interesting to see where this leads us. Let me take you into a couple of examples of this. If you look at the college board, the college board is run by a guy named David Coleman. He's called the architect of Common Core. The, common, the, the college board does SAT tests. But they also do AP tests for about 47 different AP courses. So I, I've already learned all the years I've been doing this. It doesn't matter how good your standards are. It doesn't even matter how good your textbooks are. The test is what drives everything. Teachers teach to the test because that's where merit pay comes from. That's where class advancement comes from. So testing is everything. We can have great standards. We can have great textbooks. And they have really bad tests. And the textbooks and standards really don't matter that much. So what happens on testing if you look particularly at what happens with history testing, this is the AP history curriculum. It's 162 pages long. This is what the college board puts out for all teachers. You want your teacher, you want your kids to pass the test. This is what you need to have them aware of. So in 162 pages of covering American history, and by the way, these are the top kids in history in the United States. 460,000 kids a year go through this. And these 460,000 kids, they get both college credit and high school credit for this. So these are really sharp history kids. This is where your next history teachers, et cetera, come from, your history writers. So when you look at the 162 pages, if we just take one area, one specific area like World War II, it's interesting to me that in these standards on which the test is, is based, this is what you take for the test, it's interesting that in those standards, there's not a single mention of D-Day or Battle of the Bulge or Battle of Midway or Iwo Jima. None of the major battles of World War II. Actually, none of the major heroes of World War II. There is no mention of Eisenhower or of Patton or of MacArthur or of Nimitz. As a matter of fact, we don't even talk about the enemies. There's no mention of Hitler. There's no mention of the Nazis. There's no mention of the Holocaust. Now, how you study World War II without mentioning that 
And by the way, out of 162 pages, it's half a page is the entirety of World War II. That's all you cover on World War II is a half a page. But what you will find on that half page is a very interesting statement. It says, the decision to drop the atomic bomb raised questions about American values. So what we do call into question is America. We don't cover the Japanese, we don't cover the, the Germans, but we do cover the Americans. Raised questions about American values. Now, why would that be? It's because we don't know history. Uh, for example, we were planning Operation Downfall. It looked like we were going to have to do a D-Day invasion like we did in Germany to end the, the, the Pacific War, or excuse me, to end the European War. The Pacific War looked like we were going to do the same thing. We have beaten Japan in every single island-hopping battle. They have not won a single battle. They have no allies left. Uh, Germany and, and Italy have both fallen but they won't give up. They just keep fighting and keep fighting and keep fighting and they won't give up. They're determined to all die before they give up. So at that point, General Curtis LeMay, who was chief of the Air Force at that time, got the projections. It looked like that if we invaded Japan in a D-Day invasion, it would kill one million Americans between two and four million allied folks and we would have to kill between five and 10 million Japanese before they would give up. So we're looking at possibly 15 million, up to 15 million deaths on this. It was at that point that Truman said, no, we're not going to kill a, a million Americans doing this. Uh, we actually, last week, developed this weapon that we're going to try. We've never tried it before. We tested it last week. We think it'll work. They put it on the USS Indianapolis, shipped it over to Saipan, put it on the planes from Saipan. They went into Japan. They dropped the atomic bomb. Now, the atomic bomb, the result of dropping that atomic bomb was 150,000 immediate deaths, 150,000 radiation deaths. 300,000 deaths, but compare that to the potential 15 million deaths. So I'm not sure what the problem with the values is here at this point. We've saved a, a lot of deaths, but nonetheless, just talk about beheading. Do you know the Japanese beheaded more? We, military historian was telling us Japanese beheaded more soldiers in one camp than we killed with two atomic bombs. More than 300,000 soldiers were beheaded. Um, actually, the Japanese officers would have competitions to see who could behead 100 soldiers the fastest, and they would have to have runoffs because they were so fast at beheading soldiers. Where's that part of history? Where did the kids hear anything about that at all? Heard nothing about that. Uh, interestingly, the Americans are what we hear about, and we question their values. And then when you look at what happened with the atomic bomb, we don't even talk about the fact that before we dropped the bomb, we dropped 70 million leaflets telling the Japanese the cities we were going to bomb, including Nagasaki, Hiroshima. We said we're going to destroy the military capabilities. We do not want to hurt a single person. Please leave because we're going to bomb these cities. Now, of course, the American pilots didn't like that because now we've told the Japanese where to set up all their anti-aircraft defenses, but we told them the cities were going to bomb ahead of time. So we dropped 70 million leaflets. We even set up, we took the island of Saipan, set up a radio station called KSAI. Every 15 minutes, we broadcast onto the Japanese mainland, the bomb is coming. Get away. The bomb is, we told them it was coming every 15 minutes because their leaders wouldn't say anything about it. So we went around the leaders. So we did all of this forewarning, and this is somehow a problem with American values. I don't know anybody else would do that. Plus, after we bombed the place, we rebuild it. Now, who else does that? And, and so we're going to tell kids how bad America is, and this is what we have in history. So you, you look at all the stuff, all the nations. Holocaust, hadn't heard about that before. Exactly right. 22% of American kids have, have never heard the Holocaust. 68% of American kids have never heard of Auschwitz, which is exactly why President Trump signed a new law. The new law he signed is the Never Again Education Act. We have to start teaching the Holocaust. We should be doing that in history. Why do we have to pass a law to teach kids the Holocaust? Because we don't teach history. We don't even teach the basics of history. We teach how bad America is. So we're really into deconstructionism. That's what we emphasize. That there's other places. Critical race theory is now the new manifestation of deconstructionism. We're tearing it down over the basis of race, how terrible America is on race, how terrible America has been on race. Um, Howard Zinn probably started this back in the early 80s. Uh, the, the history he did is really pathetic from a historical standpoint, but if you want to find every war on America knows this, including some that didn't even exist, he gives you all of that. Uh, another book that's popular today is, is The Myth of 
uh, the myth of American exceptionalism. There's nothing special about America. We're one of the worst nations in the world. We have debates with the professors, and they're continually saying America's done more evil in the world than she's ever done good. I mean, it's just unbelievable what we're putting out on, on a regular diet for these kids. So there's a great passage in Hosea 8, 7 that says they sowed the wind and they reap a tornado. They've been pumping all this negative stuff into kids now for over 20 years, and it's interesting to see what the results have been. We're reaping a tornado as a result. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us in Luke 640, every student when he's fully trained will be like his teacher. If the only thing you know about America is how terrible it is, yeah, let's burn it down. Let, let's tear it down because she's, well, we haven't taught the good stuff in, in quite a while. And so this is the result of what we see, and there's just so many others I could point to. What I want to do is I, I want to cover a couple of issues that are in the news right now. Um, just look at them from a historical standpoint. One is COVID, what's happening with COVID, and then or, or what's happening with statues, but the other is COVID. I want to start with COVID first. So what we have with the COVID pandemic is, interestingly, right now on the CDC's early numbers. Now, I didn't say that quite right. On the CDC's numbers that they used before they revised them, and again, last week, they revised the numbers again. But I'm going to go with the high numbers that they have, that there were over 200,000 deaths in America, 210,000 deaths. On the basis of those numbers, the mortality rate that we have for COVID is four one hundredths of one percent. So that's the high numbers. Now, CDC has revised that down, knocked about 90 percent off of that. And again, uh, last week they came out at night and said, well, here's the numbers for school kids and for students, and they're way down as well. So, but we're going to keep the high numbers, four one hundredths of one percent. Now, you take that mortality rate. And compare that, uh, by the way, to other pandemics we've had. America has averaged a medical pandemic once every 15 years for 400 years. We've had tons of medical pandemics. So let me take you back into the 1600s, the smallpox pandemic. The pandemic now is four one-hundredths of one percent mortality rate. Back then, it was a 70 percent mortality rate. That's just a little bit different than four one hundredths of one percent, and that's the high numbers, not the revised numbers. And then if you look at the city that's been impacted the most in America, it's New York City. They have ten times more cases than anyone else, ten times more deaths than anyone else, and that puts them at four tenths of one percent. But let me take you back to the yellow fever epidemic of Philadelphia in 1793, when Philadelphia experienced a 25 percent mortality rate, not a four tenths of one percent mortality rate. So I can just go through history and show you this is really one of the lesser pandemics we've had, and we're acting like this is the worst one we've ever had. Uh, as I'll tell you right now, in Texas, even with the high numbers, uh, COVID is number 14 leading cause of death in Texas. You're twice as likely to die from septicemia in Texas as you are from COVID. Nobody even knows what septicemia is, but nonetheless, you're twice as likely. We never shut it down over the other 13 things, but we've shut it down over the 14 thing doesn't even make logical sense. So when you look at, at the comparison of this, we've not only had things like smallpox and yellow fever epidemics, but we've also had those of cholera, uh, four different cholera epidemics, scarlet fever in the 1850s, uh, diphtheria, number of diphtheria epidemics, measles, even in the 1980s, we were having measles epidemics. You may recall that while Pre President Ronald Reagan uh, was in office, we had tens of thousands of Americans die in measles, measles epidemics. That's not that far ago. Tuberculosis epidemics, typhoid epidemics, a number of those. Polio, nearly 40 years of polio epidemics, uh, killed tens of thousands of Americans. Uh, that was a big emphasis, remember, with Franklin Roosevelt because he also had polio. We've had four different types of influenza, the 1918 Spanish flu, 1956 Asian flu, the 1968 Hong Kong flu, the 19... Uh, uh, the 2012 Spanish flu, uh, swine flu, every one of them had a higher mortality rate than what COVID has. All, all, the, all the epidemics of flu did. So we're looking at COVID and saying this is really a terrible epidemic. We're treating it like it is, but numerically, it's not been a big deal in American's history compared to other things. Even now, uh, four times as many people die from heart disease in America as die from COVID, and we haven't shut it down over heart disease. Uh, accidents, you're three times more likely to die from a car accident in California than you are at COVID. So there's so many things higher, and we have focused on this with a lot of fear. So when you look at the medical stuff, the face of, of medicine has been Dr. Fauci, and now he's kind of gone off the scene, and 
just seeing the real of all the predictions he made and how he's had to revise them. I mean, he just keeps revising these things down and down and down. So except for CNN, nobody really goes to him anymore. And so with, when you look at medical experts, it's interesting. This is a medical experts in the 1830s. We own about 120,000 documents from before 1812. Uh, this is after 1812. We own thousands of documents from there, like World War II stuff. But this is 1831. These are the top physicians of the day. This is the medical journal. This is the cutting edge of medicine. A couple articles in here are of interest to me. The preservation of human life in cases of fire. Back then, you averaged burning your home down about once every six years in America. That's because you cooked inside. Ladies wore those hoop skirts as they would turn the back to the, to the stove to do something else. It's the dress would catch on fire, catch the house on fire, the house would burn down. That's why, like at Mount Vernon, they built a kitchen in a separate building so it wouldn't burn the rest of the house down. And that became common to have kitchen in a separate building. So about every six years, you'd burn your house down. And so what they've done in 1831 is they have found a way to save people's life when the house is burning down. You can actually go inside and get them. If they're upstairs, you can bring them down. And so they have created a suit that enables a person to pass through an avenue or a room filled with flame to ascend or descend a flight of stairs uh, or a ladder from enveloped in flame. In other words, you can be in the midst of the fire and not be burned. And so they show you this, this suit that they've come up with. It's wrapped with a wire mesh on the outside, and it allows you, it is a fireproof suit. It's the first fireproof suit in history. So you can put this on, you can go in, get people out, save lives, and you're not going to get burned doing it. Great medical discovery, except as it turns out, it's made out of asbestos. <laughs> it has a mask of asbestos. It has gloves of asbestos. It has boots of asbestos. It's an asbestos suit, but it's going to save lives. Mm, maybe not. But nonetheless, that's the, the state of medicine of the day. This is a breakthrough discovery. Uh, this next article is, is a lot of fun as well because if you work on, you know, the ranch we've got. We, we're in Texas, so our summer's 110, 115. We work outside. Uh, for us, that's a time when we chainsaw a lot of the brush off. Our brush grows like a lot of wheat does elsewhere. We don't grow wheat, we grow weeds. And so we go after it with chainsaws all summer long. And now we find that when we do, we need to make sure that when we take a break, we do not drink any type of cold water. As the doctors point out to us, it's not to be wondered at, therefore, that when a person, a heat person, is exposed at the same time to the influence of intense heat during midsummer and to the sudden impression of cold water taken in the stomach, that an immediate cessation of life should be the result. The title of the article is called Sudden Death in Cold Water. <laughs> Never drink cold water when you're hot. It'll kill you every time. <laughs> sounds kind of like COVID is what it sounds like. So uh, it's, it's interesting how medicine changes so rapidly, especially with stuff that, when stuff is new, when they really don't know about stuff. Over the years, you kind of get it worked out, but when something's brand new, the, the panic that goes with it's amazing. Now, from a constitutional standpoint, we have the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Those two cannot be separated. Uh, there are 161 words that begin the Declaration. has six principles of government. All six of those principles are embodied fully in the Constitution of the United States. But I'm going to start you off with the first three principles in the Declaration. The first three principles, there's 45 words. This is what the Declaration says in 45 words. This defines government. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So first off, we acknowledge that there's a creator. That's the first thing government did, the creator. This was the unanimous declaration in 13 United States of America. So point number one, there is a creator. Point number two, we're endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. So there are a set of rights that don't come from government. They come from God. We call them natural rights or inalienable rights. And they include things like life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So point one, there's a creator. Point two, the creator gives to every individual a certain set of rights. And point three, governments are created to protect inalienable rights. Now, we'll get around to securing the borders later. We'll get around to jobs, the economy, et cetera. But number one purpose of government is to make sure you have the right to practice inalienable rights. That was not being practiced in any other government in the world at that time. Even though the Brits had the Magna Carta, King George III was violating the Magna Carta. That's one of the reasons we separated because we no longer had an inalienable right to worship. They told us which church to go to and where we would meet. We no longer had the right to keep and bear arms. They took guns from us, and the British came to make sure that in Williamsburg they took all the guns and magazines. So all these rights government was infringing, which is why we said, no, 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 here's our declaration. There is a God. 
He gives us rights. Government exists to protect inalienable rights. Now, when you look at inalienable rights, there are three listed in the Declaration in those 45 words, but then after that, 11 years later, we came back and added a Bill of Rights. And they said, you remember we told you in the Declaration we had the right to life, liberty, and property? Well, here's a bunch of the other rights because we told you in the Declaration, among others, was life, liberty, and property. Here's some of the others. So the First Amendment has five rights. The Second Amendment has two rights. The Third Amendment has one right. The Fourth through the Eighth Amendments have about nine rights in them. These are all considered inalienable rights. These are things government is not allowed to touch. So as you look at all the inalienable rights that are there, and you look at how the founding fathers defined inalienable rights, uh, they identified about two dozen. Not all are in the Bill of Rights, but they still identified them and said these are all rights we all understand government can't touch. So the right to expatriation is not in the Declaration or Bill of Rights. Founding Fathers said that is a natural right. The right of expatriation is the right for each of us to go to any other state and come back. We're not like Europe where you have to have a passport to go from state to state. You, you can move freely. Now with the European Union, they can move freely. But nonetheless, that's called the right of expatriation. They called that an able right. God gives you the freedom to move around between places. So another inalienable right, Thomas Jefferson gave us at his inauguration, first inauguration, right here in this middle part. He said, we all recognize the inalienable right that God has given every one of us to earn a living. And they said, it is the government is not to interfere with us earning livings because that is what we call the free enterprise system. And by the way, free enterprise back... 20 years ago, uh, in, the thir in, the in, in the 1990s, 1980s, by definition in economic textbooks, free enterprise meant enterprise that was free from the regulation or control of government. So a free market system was one that is not regulated, controlled by the government. And the right to work was an inalienable right. How do we know it's a right to work? Because the Bible tells us it is. We're told in 1 Timothy 5, 8 that if you don't provide for your own household, you're worse than an infidel. You've denied the faith. Number one thing we're to do is to work and earn a living for our household, and that is free enterprise. It's not to be regulated by government, but what's the one thing we've seen go down in COVID? Our inalienable right to work. It's been taken over and controlled. Governors have stepped in, and now in the last two weeks, we're starting to see the federal courts really weigh in strongly on this. Having 206 constitutional judges appointed by President Trump has made a real difference, but we've now seen the, the federal government say, no, Governor of Pennsylvania, you're wrong. Governor of Michigan, you're wrong. Uh, this week, Governor of Texas, you're wrong. Even red governors that go over that line and get into places they shouldn't be, the courts are saying, no, no, you, you can't do that. Government exists to protect inalienable rights. So we've seen these things now being, being kind of restored as we go along, but they never should have been touched anyway. But then again, we don't teach government like we used to. We sure don't teach the Constitution like we used to. We don't know original intent, and so we don't even understand some of these rights and how they've been violated. But we particularly, as even MacArthur talked about, how the governor of California, governor of California this week said, okay, I will let you have church. I'll consider it essential, but you're only allowed to have one congregant per service. So as we're sitting here this morning, California has been told they can only have one person attend church each week. Come on. But see, this is what we're seeing governors do with overreach is, is so many aspects of this. So that's the Bill of Rights. COVID should never have had an impact. It did. Uh, we saw that under COVID, four of the five rights in the First Amendment have come under attack. Uh, we saw everything that you, you got petition, you got religion, you got assembly, and you got speech and press, everything except press. The governors didn't go after the press. I wonder why that is. I wonder why they left the press alone. Went after all the other four. We've had lawsuits on all of those. Uh, the Second Amendment, uh, we saw, for example, Mayor of Jackson said, oh, COVID's here. You can't have guns anymore. What's the correlation there? But we've seen uh, leaders step in to say that Second Amendment has to go away because of COVID. Third Amendment says essentially that government can't set up shop in your house. And now we've seen, particularly in states like Virginia and elsewhere, that, oh, we've heard you've been exposed to COVID. We're going to put an ankle bracelet on you to make sure you can't leave your house. We're going to monitor everywhere you go, everything you do. No, that's Third Amendment stuff. Government can't set up shop in my house. The Fourth and the Eighth Amendments were, were put together so that we would assume that we're innocent until proven guilty, except you're all guilty of COVID until we can prove otherwise. So rather than masking the sick, we're going to mask the healthy. No, that's exactly the opposite premise. So we've just seen the Bill of Rights just go by the way. But then again, only one out of a thousand Americans knows the rights that are in the First Amendment. 
You can't defend your rights if you don't know what they are, but we don't teach them anymore. Only 24% of Americans can identify the three branches of government today. So not only are we lousy on history, we're lousy on government, we're lousy on civics, we're lousy on everything else. We just don't teach them the way we used to. So that's COVID. Move from that into other issues that are in the news, statues. Uh, what we see with statues, they're coming down because they represent racist folks. And a lot of that goes back. You look at the founding fathers. As you can clearly see, that's a bunch of white guys. That's all they are is white guys. There's nobody. You're saying that's another problem with the way we teach history today. We used to know that the American Revolution was not white guys. It was white and black, men and women, Christians and Jews, and more than, four, more than 20 different nationalities fought in the revolution. Washington had 20 Irish generals. He had a number of Polish generals. We had generals from all over the world, French generals. Uh, we had German generals, Prussian generals. Everybody came to fight for freedom. And so it was a, a collage of every kind of, a, it, was, it was what you see in Revelation 7 in the Bible, that in, they gathered around his throne were people from all tribes, all languages, all nations, etc. The ladies of Cuba helped raise money for George Washington, sent him money. I mean, it was Hispanic, it was everybody you can think of. But we see something like that, and not that these weren't the guys that did it, they did. But the problem with us today is we no longer know guys like Wentworth Cheswell. Wentworth Cheswell, black man elected office in New Hampshire in 1768, held political office there for 49 years, held, held eight different political positions. He made a Paul Revere-like ride, was a great patriot of the day. He's a historian of New, New Hampshire. Uh, we also have folks like John Morant, the second best-selling black narrative in history. Nobody even knows him today from the American Revolution. We have the same thing with Absalom Jones, the first black man ordained to a major church position in America back in the founding era. He was a soldier in the American American Revolution. William Nell, the famous black historian who has entire books written just on the black patriots of the American Revolution, the black patriots of the War of 1812. Uh, we have, in, in addition, uh, the Battle of Lexington. Black patriot Prince Esterbrook. We erected monuments to Prince Esterbrook, who was one of the patriots there. And by the way, the, the Battle of Lexington, I'll talk more about it tonight. It was the church of the Reverend Jonas Clark who went out to take on the British and save the town from the British. Black and whites went to church together in that church, and they were out there defending the town. Black and whites were shot as a result. Uh, you have uh, William, excuse me, <coughs> Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel Haynes is the first black man to receive a degree of higher education in America. He is the black pastor of white churches all over New England, pastor of churches in Vermont, Massachusetts, New Hampshire. Uh, he's also the first black man to have a sermon published, one of the most famous black guys in history, except we don't know anything about him today. He's in the American founding. Uh, this is James Armistead, the double spy of the American Revolution, first double spy in American history. George Washington, General Lafayette, credited him with shaving months, maybe years off the revolution because of intelligence work. He fed Cornwall all the bad information, fed Washington Lafayette all the good information, which allowed us to trap Cornwallis. These guys don't think it would have ended without, without this black patriot, and we don't even know who James Armistead is now. You've got Peter Salem, who's the hero of Bunker Hill, more than a dozen military commendations that day. They presented him to the commander-in-chief as a hero of the battle. Um, you have individuals like John Chavez, great black educator, trained black and white people. Uh, you have Richard Allen, uh, founded the first black denomination, was a, a trained to be an early black medical guy, but Benjamin Rush signed of the Declaration. He's in the American Revolution. Uh, we have guys like Benjamin Banneker, the first, the first black American to do a scientific journal. It was distributed all over Europe by Thomas Jefferson to show how smart blacks were. He says, if anybody says that blacks are not equal rights, you just show them Benjamin Banneker's almanac. He's the guy who laid out Washington, D.C. Uh, we've got... Uh, Prince Sisson, early SEAL team member, probably the first SEAL team expedition there was with this guy, 1778, uh, the Battle of Newport. It's just so many guys that we know nothing about today. How come we don't know anything about these guys? You know, what, what, what's happening? We'll give you one, just one more quick example. This guy right here is a guy named Harry Hoosier. Harry Hoosier was a preacher back in the Great Awakenings. Uh, he preached along with Francis Asbury, except Francis Asbury said, Harry gets larger crowds than I do. Francis Asbury had massive crowds. He rode more than 300,000 miles on horseback preaching the gospel. And he said that Harry draws bigger crowds than I do. Benjamin Rush signed of the Declaration said, I've heard Harry preach. He's the greatest orator I've ever heard. Well, he's, he's heard Patrick Henry and all the other guys. Yeah, but Harry's better than that. Harry really preached to the blue-collar type of guys in America. Uh, he was preaching to the frontiers guys and the woodsmen and all those guys that were really pretty rough. And as they would get converted and their life would change and their behavior would change, and they're still rough and tough guys, but now they're, they're saved. They're, they're Christians. Their behavior is real different. 
and he preached, Harry, Harry preached largely uh, out on the east part of, of the, the Americas. But as these guys, I mean, the frontiersmen, as America was expanded west, they went with the expansion because they are mountain, mountain men and frontier guys. And as they ended up over in areas toward the west, other mountain men go, these guys are different. What's up with them? And people say, oh, they're a bunch of those Hoosier guys. Well, they ended up being called Hoosiers, and the places they ended up were the Indiana Territory. And I wonder how many people in Indiana know that they were named after a black evangelist. <laughs> Probably nobody. And find me a history book today that has that story in it. No, that might make America look good. We can't do that. So, I mean, there's so much black history. So why in the world don't we have any black history like this anymore? It goes to this guy right here, Woodrow Wilson. In 1902, he came out with a five-volume set called The History of the American People. Now, he was a teacher. He was an academic. He came out with this five-volume set, and progressives go, oh, my gosh, this is so good academically. This is the best ever. And so the next year, Princeton University offered him the presidency of Princeton University. He's the first non-clergyman to become president of Princeton University. So he's here, and that sits him on a platform, and they go, my gosh, if he's good enough for Princeton, let's make him president of the United States, not just president of Princeton. So he becomes president, but he is a hardcore racist. And, that har and it came out in his book. Uh, but as a hardcore racist, when he became president of the United States, he took every black that was serving in the federal government and fired them except one. He wanted a token black. In addition to that, he helped bring back the second revival of the Klan, uh, based on his five-volume set, the Ku Klux Klan did a recruiting film called Birth of a Nation, which, which Woodrow Wilson showed at the White House. The script from that was taken from his history book, so it's, a, it's really a white racist book that he had. Um, but in addition to that, the Klan would go from theater to theater across America saying, see, we're the guys that saved America. We're the good guys. Look at all the great we've done. Uh, his administration, Wilson's administration, his administration marched openly with the Klan down the streets of Washington, D.C. Again, this is what we call the second revival of the Klan. The first was when it was formed in 1866. This is coming back. Woodrow Wilson has a lot to do with that. So his history of the American people, how did it, I mean, how, how is it the influence that we don't know black folks anymore? Because in his history, five volumes of the American history, he has not a single black person in his book at all, not even Frederick Douglass, who's the most photographed man in America in the 1800s, photographed more than Abraham Lincoln, better known. And he has not a single black person in his book entirely. But in case you've never run into a black, because he's not going to tell you about them, he does at least give you a picture of a black person. And so you see the picture here, kind of a strange looking picture. That's what Woodrow Wilson shows you the black people look like. Now, why would he do this? Because when he was growing up as a young boy, the thing that became the rage in his day were the writings of Darwin, and he grew up on those writings. And Darwin, now this is the origin of species. We te still teach this in school today, except this is the original, 1859. We just don't use all the title that's there. You see what the title is? The origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races and the struggle for life. So evolution is about some races are more favored than other races. And after he did the origin of species, he came back a few years later with the descent of man. In the descent of man, he at 11 occasions says, the reason you have darker skinned people is they've not evolved as far as the white people have. He says, so what we need to do is send dark skinned people back to Africa, let them stay there until they evolve and become white, and when they become white, let's bring them back to America. If we want to cancel something, why don't we cancel Darwin? Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> And there's so many areas of science now that specifically contradict his thesis from back then, but yet we cling to him with a rabidity in, in public schools. We can't tell the good things, but we can't talk about Darwin. We just take that favorite racist stuff off, off the title, but we still teach the stuff. So this is why you have this kind of a picture from Woodrow Wilson in his book. This is, they're just not evolved enough. If black folks will just go back to Africa until they turn white, then they'll be as evolved. Crazy stuff. So Woodrow Wilson is the one that causes us today to not even know our black heroes anymore. They're 
they're just gone. Not that they weren't there. They were there. We just don't cover this in history anymore. So when you look at these guys, we're historically illiterate about this much of America. And significantly, this is a newspaper we own from 1793. This is a Pennsylvania uh, piece. And I want you to see the middle part here. It says, in the borough of eastern Pennsylvania, a free Negro man of the name of Thomas Hercules was on the sixth day uh, of July last chosen clerk of that borough by decided majority of voters. This we mention as proof of the growing liberality of the present age when virtue and worth alone and not mere color or trippery of rank and splendor began to recommend a man of places of trust and confidence. You have a black guy elected in an overwhelmingly white town, and they say, see, we don't really care what your color is. We care whether you can do the job. If you're confident, we'll elect it, and this is the way we should be thinking, and they're praising themselves for thinking that we don't care what the race is. We don't care what the color is. We care what the competency is. Now, it's interesting. That is a biblical approach. When you look at what the... And by the way, let me talk about science for just a minute, because when you look at race and science, about 10 years ago, a major study came out, Scientific American, National Geographic, all these guys, and it was a DNA study, because we've advanced so far with DNA in the last 20 years. And so this, this study that came out, the DNA results, this is what they said. They said, all races share 99.99% plus of the same genetic materials, which means that a division of race is largely subjective. Now, that's scientifically, DNA-wise. They pointed out that any two twin animals, identical twin animals in nature, if you take something like two identical twin giraffes or two twin deer or two twi twin dog, whatever, they said any two identical twins in nature have less similarity in their DNA than any two people from any part of the earth, which means that LeBron James and I have more in common than two identical <laughs> twins in nature. But that's scientific stuff. Any two Americans from any race have more in common DNA-wise than do any two identical twins in nature. That's pretty astounding stuff. See, this goes to the Bible thing. A division of race is subjective. Look what the Bible tells us in Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So what's it start with? It starts with one man. Um, one man. I, I was in a black church recently teaching black history, which is weird. Eight, church of 8,000. I'm the only white guy in the church, and I'm teaching black history. But it's because most folks don't know history anymore. And so you go through all these great heroes, and I, I looked at all the black faces and said, by the way, if you didn't know, I'm your cousin. We're related. You know, because Adam is the one man. There's been 150 generations since Adam, so we're all at least 150th cousin with each other. We have more DNA in common because we came from a common parent than do any two identical twins in nature. And so that's where science is on this, but that's also where the Bible is. He made from one man every race of man. Now, when you look at how God sees race, it's pretty simple. He tells us in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord looks not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. He really doesn't look on the outside. He looks on the inside. So from God's standpoint, there's really only two groups of people on the face of the earth, those who know God and those who don't. And that's it. Because he looks on the inside, he doesn't look on the outside. See, there's only four races of people. There's 32,000 ethnicities. We often say there's a bunch of races. There's not. There's four, scientifically, there's four races, but there's 32,000 ethnicities. So what I want to talk about for the remainder of time is the way that we should look at the race issue because right now, the way kids are taught in school, they're not looking at it the right way. And you see what's happening as a result of that all over the nation. Uh, both sides predict that there's a high likelihood of a civil war after the election because of the way we've been teaching because those social justice warriors are not going to put up with whatever happens and, you know, we're going to have to burn it down. And so whether that happens or not, who knows, but we shouldn't be having this conversation at all, but we're having it because of the way we've been teaching for the last several decades. So nonetheless, going back to this thing, let me start with the modern view of racism. The way we teach race today is largely strictly white on black. It's all about white privilege. But from a historical standpoint and a biblical standpoint, the relationship between whites and blacks has a lot to do with the way we view history. And, and that's what I was talking about, showing you even some of the, that's why I showed you some of those black faces we don't know about anymore. If we knew about that, the narrative today would be very different. If we knew about all the blacks that held office, for example, in the American founding, um, while you have Georgia and South Carolina and southern states doing bad stuff, in the northern states, totally different. Uh, for example, at the time the Constitution was ratified, all the northern states and blacks voted. 
Matter of fact, in Baltimore, 85 percent of blacks voted to ratify the U.S. Constitution. You have blacks elected to office in Maryland, 1641, and in New Hampshire in 1768, Pennsylvania, 1793. There was never a time in Massachusetts when blacks could not vote in Massachusetts. So that's not known today. So what we say is, well, we don't know our history. So what we do is we create a whole different narrative about how it's always been racist, how it's always been... 1793, John Hancock held, the governor of Massachusetts held what was called an equality ball, pointing out that blacks and whites are equal, equal under the law, equal with rights, equal with opportunities, not in the South, but in the North. But see, what we do is we take Southern history and show that's like that's everything to happen. Everything that Georgia and South Carolina did is what the whole nation did. No, it's not. It's a whole different thing, but we don't teach history that way. So having said that, there's some important things to know about slavery, eight things I want to show you uh, to, to wrap up this first session. And in doing that, let me start with just an overview on racism itself. Can we agree that racism is a sin? Okay. Then if you make that concession, you have just admitted something. If it's a sin, it affects everybody. You don't just have Irish sins. You don't just have teenager sins or women's sins or, or French sins or if it's a sin, it affects everybody. Everybody's affected by it. It affects all humans. Great example is what happened in Rwanda 10 years ago. One million killed in a race fight, but it was blacks fighting blacks. But it's, you're the wrong black. It, it was the, the Hutus and the Tutsis killed a million of each other with machetes, and it was a race battle because you're the wrong race. No, no, no. I'm black too. Well, you're the wrong. See, if we were all white, we would still say, but you've got blue eyes. Oh, you've got green eyes or you're too tall. We would find a way to divide ourselves. I mean, that's just the story of mankind. We will find a way to divide ourselves even if we all look the same. We're gonna, your voice is different. So racism affects everybody. It's not a white, but the way we teach it in America today, it can only occur from whites against blacks. That's just not, that's not true. It's a sin that affects all humans. So the eight things to know, let's start out front saying that we understand slavery was a barbaric institution. No defense of slavery, not going to defend it, shouldn't be defended. You look at what happened with the, the slave trade, uh, bringing people out. You, you look at what happened with the way they were treated. Um, all of us, if you've worked on, in the country, you've got scars of some kind to show. I've got plenty of scars myself, but I don't have scars that are as deep as those. How many times did you have to get beat to create scars that are half inch tall all over your back? That's unbelievably inhumane and barbaric. So we agree with that. There, there's no defense of slavery, not going to defend slavery, doesn't need to be defended, shouldn't be defended. Second thing to point out is America was not a world leader in the global slave trade. My kids today hear that we were. Here's the African slave trade. It occurred from 1501 through 1875. 12.7 million Africans were involuntarily taken out of Africa. Where did they go? Professor recently said all 12.7 million went to the United States. No, but see, this is what kids are getting told. The whole African slave trade was about us. 43% of slaves went to Portugal and Brazil. 24% went to Great Britain, 15% to Spain, 11% to France, 5% to the Dutch, 2.5% to America, 1% to Denmark. America is one of the least offending nations when it came to the slave trade. Now, that doesn't justify the 300,000 slaves we took in, but in the perspective of things, we're not the only nation out there. How come Brazil and Portugal get a free pass when nearly half the slaves went there, and America takes all the blame because 2.5 percent went here? Now, in addition to that, in addition to what happened, slavery was a global condition. Every nation was involved with it. Uh, we can't find a single nation in history back then that did not have slaves, not a single nation. Every single one of them did, including every, every nation in Africa. So did you know that America was the first nation in the world to ban the slave trade? We did it in 1807. No nation did it before we did. So we may all be bad, but at least we're the best of the bad. We may be bad for having slaves, but we're the first one to say this is coming to an end. Now, notice 1807 is the first time. See, kids today think that everybody's hated slavery throughout all of history, and America is the one that never got on board. No, nobody hated slavery until America got on board, 1807. I mean, nobody took action against slavery until we did in 1807. Second thing to point out is after we did, we took a navy of US, uh, squadron of U.S. Navy ships and put them off the coast of Africa to keep any other nations from being able to take slaves out of Africa. 
So we actually put the Navy over there to stop everybody else. We had that naval squadron from 1819 to 1861. We brought it home when we got involved in the Civil War, but our American ships would interdict ships from other slavers from other nations and keep them from going and taking slaves. Um, we worked at the British did so as well. Britain, Britain was really good on this as well. And so the British and the American navies, we each had squadrons over there. And even in the 1900s, the British were still interdicting slave ships coming out of Africa with slaves in the 1900s. So in addition to us being the first to ban the slave trade, us being uh, having a squadron to keep any other nation from engaging in the slave trade, we're the fourth nation in the world to ban slavery. We banned slavery in 1865. There were 124 nations in the world at the time. We're in the top 1%. Now, Great Britain beat us, 1833, they did. Uh, then you had uh, Fran Denmark and then France and then America. So we're fourth in this thing. But I'll point out that New England had banned slavery by 1804. Nobody in the world banned slavery before that large segment of America did, New England did. But as a nation, we didn't do it until 1865. Now, notice this. We're the fourth in the world to ban slavery. We did it in 1865. That's only 150 years ago. Yeah. The movement to end slavery is a fairly young movement in the history of the world. See, Great Britain did it in 1833. They were the first in the world. That's still under two centuries. So it's not like everybody's understood that slavery was wrong. That's just not the case. But America was right up top in taking action. Now, interestingly, when you look at where we are today, did you know that there are 94 nations today that still have not criminalized slavery? 193 nations of the UN, more than half the world, or right at half the world, Still, it's not illegal to have slaves. There are 40 million active slaves in the world today. There are more slaves today than there are in the entire history of four centuries of the slave trade. I actually run a, a, helped run a national organization called the Nazarene Fund. We go in and rescue slaves today. Last week, we did an insertion operation where we freed 12 slaves. Because, see, we got started five years ago when ISIS was really big in the Middle East, and they were enslaving Christians and religious minorities. In the Middle East, we had 2.5 million Christians that fell to under 500,000. ISIS was just exterminating them, wiping them out. We were able to go in and save about 100,000. Uh, Australia still to this day takes anybody we send them. Same with Canada. We did all the, the pre-vetting, uh, immigration pre-vetting before Trump talked about it because he wasn't in office yet. So we, do, we have all these CIA guys and others that do the screen of every person we send to these foreign nations. And they just take anybody we send them because we do such a thorough job of vetting. But we actually take, and we don't just wait for them to be freed. We actually send in guys. We hired Kurds. Kurds are Muslims who love Christians and hate ISIS. And we would hire Kurds to go in and hit the ISIS camps and bring their slaves out. Two of our guys were killed in these operations. One guy's been shot 17 times. This is stuff going on today. It's stuff going on right now. We were involved in, in a, an operation just last week. We had to pull aside because on the process of pulling off the operation, we uncovered intelligence information that is massive. We had to get it to CIA, so we can't do our operation until we get a global problem fixed. But we're right in the middle of stuff. The guy who runs it for us for 14 and a half years was the intelligence director for the Secretary of Defense of the United States. So we're actively involved in this. Kids don't know what's going on today. 40 million in the world today. And on top of that, when you look at all the nations of the world, this is the slavery map today. There's 9.2 million slaves in Africa, which is almost the same number of slaves in Africa today is almost equal to the amount that was taken out of Africa in nearly four centuries. But nonetheless, when you look at the governments taking most action, the United States is number two on the list. Only Netherlands is doing more to stop slavery and racism than America is. Ask a kid today if they've heard that. See, America is the one that's got the most slavery, the most racism. That's why we've got to tear down everything and burn it up because that's the only way to get... No. See, this is why it's important to know information, have good information. Number three is Jamestown. Jamestown, the 1619 Project uh, from, from James, the 1619 Project, New York Times, points to Jamestown and says that's when slavery started in America. It's not. That's when the slave ship was captured. Those slaves were brought ashore in America. They became indentured servants, and they ended up being freed and getting their own land. One of the indentured servants is a guy named Anthony Johnson. Indentured servant merely meant that you put yourself up as collateral for a loan to be able to come to the new world. I don't have the money to go there, but I'll work for you seven years if you'll send me there. Great. I'll work for you seven years. Then I get freed, and then the state gives me land. I become a landowner. 
Anthony Johnson became a wealthy landowner, owned a lot of land. He started sponsoring indentures for others coming. And one of the guys, he's a black man, and one of the guys who came was a black man. And he went to court in, 1851, in 1651, and in court in 1651, he said, this guy is so lazy, he'll never pay off what I've invested in him. I mean, seven years is not going to do it. I'm asking you to let me own this guy for life, because if he works the rest of his life, he won't pay off what he owns me. And the court said, sure, you can own him for life. So the first occasion of legal chattel slavery in America is a black man owning another black man. So that's where it got started, not 1619, 1651. So that's point number three to understand about history of slavery in America. Point number four is free blacks as slave owners. Um, when you look at slave owners in America, interestingly, the, the father of black history, Carter Woodson, in 1830, uh, 1930, he looked at the 1830 census of a century earlier, and he found that when you looked at free blacks in America, not slave blacks, but free blacks, he found that in South Carolina, 40 43% of free blacks owned black slaves, as did 40% of free blacks in Louisiana, 26% in Mississippi, 25% uh, in Alabama, 20% in Georgia. So blacks owning blacks was a common thing in American history. Now, there weren't as many free blacks as there were free whites, so whites owned more slaves than blacks but the percentage is still there. So black-on-black -black slavery was very common in America. Uh, if you go to point number five, point number five, notice all these Native American faces, and they've got unusual faces with them. Now, why would that be? Because according to the 1860 census, the largest percentage owner of black slaves in America were Native American tribes. The five Native American tribes, 12% of the Native American tribes were black slaves. And interestingly, not only did Native Americans have black slaves, but also you find that, um, there it is, in 1860 census, one out of every eight persons or 12% of Native American tribes were, were black slaves. Then you look at slaves, uh, Native American tribes often enslaved each other. And then on top of that, uh, black slavery ended, lasted longer than Native American tribes than anywhere else because Native American tribes are independent nations. Uh, they are not the United States. So we banned slavery in 1865, but the Native American tribes didn't. And just because we passed the 13th Amendment did not mean it applied to Native American tribes because it didn't. So slavery, black slavery, lasted longer in Native American tribes than it did in the United States. Um, we finally got treaties passed that ended slavery. Then white slavery was a big deal back then, too. The first slave law passed in America was 1671. It allowed you to own black slaves, white slaves, or Indian slaves. Anybody can be a slave. So that was the slave law in 1861. These are all slaves that were freed at the end of the Civil War out of Louisiana, black slaves and white slaves. It was real common. There's a lot of paintings back in the day of all sorts of white slaves, particularly white sex slavery was a big deal. Uh, all sorts of books done on that, all sorts of examples of it, all sorts of paintings that were there. The Republican Party was founded in May of uh, 1854, and it was founded over the slavery issue. I have its original platform. It's nine planks long, seven of the nine deal with ending slavery. It's interesting, white slavery was also part of the deal because there were white slaves. Charles Sumner, who may be the greatest abolitionist in history, he's the founder of the Republican Party, did an entire book on white slavery. So not just black slavery, but white slavery. So that was part of what went on then. Point number seven, Muslim slave traders. Muslim slave traders, they weren't just looking for blacks or whites. They were looking for people who weren't Muslims, so particularly Christians. And they would go after Christians. And Muslim slave traders in that founding era, uh, taking Christians, they took 1.25 million slaves in the early era. They took a number of slaves out of America to Middle Eastern places. If an American ship was captured overseas, uh, you were sailing on a ship and got captured like the Somali pirates today, they took you into slavery in Muslim nations. So tens of thousands of Americans enslaved, white Americans enslaved in early America. This is actually a great book on it. Christian slaves, Muslim masters from 1500 to 1800, the number of slaves that Muslims owned that were white slaves, that were Christian slaves. Final point, number eight, is Southern whites. Eighty percent of Southern whites did not own slaves. The way you listen there today, you'd think that everybody in the South was a slave owner. Eighty percent were not. Matter of fact, 92 percent of Americans overall did not own slaves. So slave owners were a definite minority per part of America, but not the narrative today. We don't have the perspective right on the narrative today. So all of those things to say that those are just good things to know. Slavery is without a primary color. It affects all humans. And knowing that about American history, if our kids knew that today, we would have a different narrative going on right now. It would be a completely different narrative. 
It should be known because all that's factual. And by the way, I encourage you to go check sources. We put this stuff on our website. We show you the original documents. We show you the original works, and we sign it back to the original source so you can check it. So that's what I want to share the first part. Bruce, back to you, brother. So a couple of things. Uh, we're going to take a break. Uh, you're welcome to come back to the second uh, service. It'll be completely different material. Uh, we need you to do this, though. Uh, we will have more people coming into the second service, so uh, please help me. Please, if you're sitting in the center section, when you come back, move to the center. And if you're sitting on the sides, please move to the outside wall. So as people are coming in, especially kind of late, uh, we can be able to find a seat without them stepping over everybody. So if you'll help me with that. On the way out, we're taking a love offering for our speaker. Helps us defray the cost and, and uh, bless him. So hope that you'll put something in the basket if you go out to grab another donut. God bless you. <laughs>